Okay, so this video is going to focus on AP Biology Curriculum uh, Topic 2.4 and 2.5, which focuses on the plasma membrane or the lipid bilayer. And so here we go. So when we talk about our cell membranes, um, cell membranes are one of those features that are common in every single type of cell, no matter if it is a eukaryote or a prokaryote. And when we talk about eukaryotes, is it a fungus or a plant cell, an animal cell, a protist, etc.? They all are going to have a cell membrane. And the same is true with prokaryotes for our bacteria and our archaeans. We all have, or every single cell on earth has a cell membrane along with cytoplasm and, nu or and uh, DNA. So anyway, let's go ahead and talk about um, the cell membrane in a bit more detail. So um, when we look at the cell membrane, in our cells, it is actually a bilayer or it has two layers. And that really comes down to because it's um, all of our cells are surrounded in water and the inside of our cells, our cytoplasm is also aqueous or has water. And so um, as we go through the slides, we'll start to see why it comes in two layers. Um, but really, if a cell needs something, it is uh, it has to enter and leave through that cell membrane. Um, they don't have mouths or something, you know? Okay, so um, when we look at this, so anything that needs to enter or leave the cell needs to pass through that uh, lipid bilayer. And we'll talk about the how in this unit. Okay, so the cell membrane ultimately is what regulates what enters and leaves the cell. All right, but how can a lipid bilayer regulate, right? That is the big question. So when we talk about um, uh, how cell membranes are made or what they're made from, like it matters so much. It's because the properties of these phospholipid building blocks, they are what determine the permeability or what can enter and leave that cell. Um, is it gonna enter or leave by passive diffusion? Is it going to need to go through a protein channel, etc.? It all comes down to these properties of these phospholipids. So our phospholipids um, are like really have two regions. You have the phosphate group and you notice that negative charge on the phosphate group and then they have some fatty acid tails, some hydrocarbons. So when we look at a phospholipid, it really has two characteristics. Um, the top part, the phosphate group, is polar, which means it's water loving or attracted to water. And then you have the nonpolar tails. These are hydrocarbons, which are basically a chain of carbons with hydrogens attached to them. Now, in a hydrocarbon chain, all of the electrons are shared equally, and therefore these are nonpolar hydrocarbons. And so the tails of a phospholipid are nonpolar. So here you have a molecule that has two parts. It has a polar and nonpolar regions. We call this um, amphipathic, actually. And so here is a picture of these um, uh, hydrocarbons, these fatty acids, you can see in this top one here, this saturated fatty acid, you can see how um, all of these hydrogens surrounding the carbons, um, when they are in those covalent bonds um, they are sh with the carbon, they are sharing the electrons all equally. Now there is a difference though between these two types of fatty acids. Um, the top one is saturated, which saturated means like full. So here it, the carbon chain is full of hydrogens, single bonds. You cannot attach any more versus in the unsaturated, um, you could technically attach two more hydrogens if you were to break like this bond here. So this is actually an unsaturated fatty acid. Now that unsaturated fatty acid though, that double bond creates like a kink in the um, hydrocarbon chain, which is important when we talk about the fluidity of a cell membrane. Okay, so let's go ahead and see. Again, we have our water-loving parts of the um, fatty acids, as well as our nonpolar non hydrophobic regions. Now, these words are important, hydrophilic 
and polar and nonpolar and hydrophobic. Um, if you are at all uh, uncertain about this, I would hit pause and take some notes, maybe rewatch this section of the video so that you are um, solid in this terminology, okay? Uh, because after teaching AP Bio for 11 years now, I promise you these are words that kids just switch in their writing. And if you switch these words, you say something is polar when you really mean nonpolar. Now the whole question is wrong. So from the bottom of my heart, please take some time and uh, uh, take some notes and like commit this to understanding. Okay. So when we look at um, uh, a molecule that has both polar and nonpolar regions, we actually call this molecule amphipathic. And you can think about it like an amphibian um, goes on both water and land, has two like habitats. So here you have an amphipathic uh, molecule. Okay. So again, here, pause the video, check yourself on these different parts, um, and then start it up when you're ready. So just in case, so in part number one, that's the phosphate group. Uh, number two right here, let's see if my pen still works. Number two, oops, this. That's the glycerol that we see also in a triglyceride. Um, and then our three is a saturated fatty acid and our four is an unsaturated fatty acid. Okay, so now when we think about these two choices, A and B right here, we wanna think about what kind of internal or external environments would create this. Like why does our cell membrane have a double, bi like a bilayer, or like, why is it not a single layer of phospholipids, right? So this comes down to those polar and nonpolar regions. We need to remember that on the outside of our cells, well, that's not writing, there we go. On the outside of our cells, it's water, it's aqueous. That's also true on the inside. And so when you look at this bilayer, if there's water outside the cell and inside the cell, it makes sense that the polar regions of those phospholipids are aligned to touch and interact with that aqueous environment, both external and internal. And then these nonpolar tails repel water and face each other. Now, in, uh, in order to have a cell that would only have a single layer of phospholipids, you would have like an aqueous, I'm not gonna write the whole thing out, I guess. An aqueous or watery environment on one side, and then in here would be like an oil or some other nonpolar liquid um, in order for those fatty acid tails to be like interacting in that environment. So um, that is one reason why you don't see a single layer because inside of here would have to be like no water for them to uh, clump this way. Okay. So another key thing about these membranes is that they are fluid and they are flexible. And we call this the, um, the fluid mosaic model. And oh, this laptop's not really good at showing my animations, um, but they move. They have like a consistency of some thick oil, um, but they are flexible. Think about like your blood cells when they travel through your capillaries, you want them to be, um, flexible and not firm and rigid, uh, that would make it very difficult for life. Um, okay, so uh, I do recommend though, Ted Ed has a good video on um, the cell membranes that would is really good at showing the fluid mosaic model and I recommend that video. All right, so now uh, if we talk about cell membranes, um, because well, and their like uh, composition. When we talk about like how fluid are they, it comes down to a couple factors. One of those being is, are those fatty acids saturated or are they unsaturated fatty acids? Because if you end up with un, a lot of unsaturated fatty acids, that would have a lot of kinks within like those tails, which would cause it all to spread out more and that would create like a very fluid, think about like almost melting um, type of a membrane versus if you have a lot of saturated fatty acids, they would be very compact and close together. 
and not very flexible. Think about like, like butter in your fridge is saturated fatty acids. Now think about that's not really fluid or flexible versus olive oil in your cabinet is made of unsaturated fatty acids and so it's more fluid. So the type of fatty acid can influence the um, fluidity of the membrane. But there's also cholesterol. Now cholesterol, if you see it here in the, mem in the cell membrane, it is yellow. So I want you to think to yourself, like is cholesterol a polar or nonpolar molecule, right? Well, it's gonna be a nonpolar molecule. Well, one reason uh, is because it's made of a sterile, which is a lipid. But here, if you didn't know that and you're looking at the picture, you find it in the same area as the fatty acid tails. So it means it's compatible with nonpolar molecules. So here, the cholesterol acts as kind of like spacers um, between lipid bi like between phospholipids. So it prevents um, a cell membrane from becoming too fluid, but also prevents it from getting too compact together. All right. And so let's go ahead and now talk about how does this lipid bilayer, though, regulate what can enter and leave the cell? So if we think about our cell membrane having that nonpolar center, molecules that are also small and nonpolar can diffuse right through the membrane. Because that nonpolar area, I want you to think about it like a bouncer at a club or something, it's, or like security at a football game. It's going to like only let certain uh, molecules pass through, and the molecules that can will be nonpolar molecules, um, like oxygen and carbon dioxide are great examples. Our mitochondria requires oxygen for aerobic respiration, so that nonpolar oxygen can just diffuse right on through. And then our mitochondria produces carbon dioxide as its waste, and it can just diffuse right on out. So we're lucky in that sense here. Uh, so anyway, let's go ahead and uh, see what cannot pass through. Well, here, because of that nonpolar core, molecules that cannot passively cross are going to be things that have, oops, that have um, a charge, like sodium ions, potassium ions, chloride ions, that plus charge prevents them from crossing through those fatty acid tails. So even though sodium is super tiny as an atom, that plus charge prevents it from entering the cell through regular simple diffusion. So it's blocked. Uh, same thing with like ammonia. Ammonia is a waste product we produce in our cells. It's also polar. So that is also blocked from just diffusing uh, simply through the membrane. Because ammonia is polar, it cannot cross that nonpolar center. We also have sometimes some large molecules like glucose here cannot just cross through by simple diffusion. Um, so there are some molecules that cannot enter a cell um, through the lipid bilayer by simple diffusion. Now you might be wondering about water though, because water is polar, right? So uh, in osmosis, we talk about water diffusing in and out of a cell. So when we talk about how water enters and leaves a cell, we have these little proteins called aquaporins that make like a little gate or opening for water to diffuse in and out. Now, the cells are surrounded in water, both the external and internal environments, right? And so when we look at, uh, at this here, there's going to be a few molecules of water because the membrane is fluid and it's flexible. You're going to have some water molecules able to kind of like sneak through the lipid bilayer. However, the majority of water is going to enter and leave a cell through aquaporins. So a cell can change its permeability of, to water by changing the amount of its aquaporins. It can increase the options of osmosis by adding more aquaporins, or it can decrease the amount of aquaporins, slowing how much water enters and leaves a cell. Okay, um, so you can pause here and check yourself. Can you explain how each of these um, can enter a cell? Can they go passively or not?
So polar amino acids, can that? A large protein, no. Starch is large, so that's a no. The fatty acid, yes. Uh, Non-polar amino acid, yes. Potassium is charged, no. Carbon dioxide is a yes because it's non-polar. And a fat-soluble vitamin, sure, because it's, um, be, the clue here, fat-soluble, meaning that it's lipid-based, non-polar, can cross right through that uh yeah, that membrane. So, um, but if a cell needs ions, glucose, polar amino acids, etc., how do they get into or out of a cell? Well, that's where protein channels come into place. And so, when we look at, um, I think I'll stop here and make a second video just for, um, Oh, I think I'm almost done. It's okay. So here you have some protein channels. And in these protein channels, uh, this is where your polar uh, or charged molecules can enter and leave a cell. And so you can think of um, these protein channels as kind of like gates or entryways into or out of a cell. Okay. So the cool thing about these proteins though, why proteins are like the perfect macromolecule to make these gateways into or out of a cell is because proteins have two categories or a few categories of amino acids. So in the region of the protein that is embedded within that lipid bilayer, that's gonna be made of hydrophobic amino acids. Um, it kind of anchors that protein within the membrane so it doesn't just pop out or slip out because then that non-polar hydrophobic area would be in water and that doesn't happen. Uh, and then on the outside where it's touching like the extracellular matrix or the cytoplasm on the inside would be made of your polar amino acids. So if you're talking, let's say we talk about like a um, uh, like a G protein receptor for pretend. So like here you have like a G protein receptor. This area that is like outside of the lipid bilayer would have like polar amino acids coming in contact with that watery environment. Okay. So here you have your hydrophilic regions and then your hydrophobic regions in the center. Now, when we look at our proteins, though, we have some that are called integral or transmembrane proteins that span the whole, like they cross the whole membrane. And then we have peripheral proteins that are going to be um, on the surface, whether it's outside or inside of the cell. All right, so here, uh, which area is made of nonpolar amino acids? A. Which region is going to be polar? B. Which one is hydrophilic? B, which one's hydrophobic? A, okay. Um, and so because the cell membrane only allows some molecules to enter uh, or to pass through and not others, we call this cell membrane selectively permeable. All right, so if we look at this cell membrane, this is my last slide to kind of summarize. You can see here that it's made of phospholipids, Proteins, now the one thing we didn't talk in this video though, are these ca carbohydrate chains that you can see them in green here. Um, so in these carbohydrate chains, they are used for identification for a cell. So all of my cells in my body would have the exact same carbohydrate chains and my um, uh, immune system knows not to attack those cells simply because that identifies uh, my cells is belonging to me. So these carbohydrate chains can be used for identification of that cell uh, type. All right, good job.